Okay. So anyway, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm hosting the Circuit Python weekly meeting for November 28th, 2022. This is the time of week when we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. What is Circuit Python? Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting usually happens at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPython UC's Discord role. As I mentioned, there's a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes, so this gives you an opportunity to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Discord, and we pin that uh, link that, that post to the uh, pin messages for the CircuitPython dev channel. You can check the pin messages to find the latest notes doc. So you can add your notes for the next meeting. If you wish to participate but can not attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a numerical overview of the entire project, quantitative overview. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from what we're all up to. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. And finally, the fifth part is in the weeds, which is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. Uh, with that, I'll do community news. Um, I'll take a timestamp. Oh, I've screwed up my timestamping. Okay, timestamps by hand from now on. Okay, don't press the reset button on the timestamper. Okay, so uh, I have a few items from the newsletter. Um, First of all, we've uh, gone over 10,000 subscribers to the Python or Microcontrollers newsletter. That went over, that happened on November 22nd. Thank you. Our goal for this weekly newsletter is to be the best source for weekly updates in the Python and hardware space. It's our readership who inspire us. Keep making. And thank you so much to Anne who does this newsletter each and every week and encourages people to subscribe. Um, and collects all kinds of news, both contributed and uh, based on her own uh, plowing through news, news sources. So thank you very much, Anne. Another milestone uh, this week was um, uh, Discord. We reached 36,000 subscribers in Discord. Um, the Adafruit Discord community, where we do all our CircuitPython development in the open, reached over 36,000 humans. Thank you. Adafruit believes Discord offers a unique way for Python and hardware folks to connect. Join us today at https adafru.it slash discord. Um, 36,000 is a lot of people. My hometown only had 30,000 people in it altogether. And the last piece of news I want to um, uh, highlight this week is uh, that the Raspberry, Raspberry Pi Pico 
which is made in various places, including uh, in the UK, and I believe maybe, I'm not sure if it's made in China or not, but now it's also being manufactured in Kenya. And there's a picture in the notes document, uh, the first pieces of the first run of the production of the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Pico, Matt was manufactured in Kenya. And there's a link to the Twitter uh, uh, thread for that. All right, so to explain where this news comes from, let's talk about the uh, CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter. It's, it's a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are in a link in the notes document. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. You can contribute your own news uh, or projects in the newsletter by editing the draft uh, in GitHub and submitting a pull request, or you can tag us with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter uh, or Mastodon, or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Uh, now we'll move on to the next major section. Um, let me take another timestamp. Uh, the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a quantitative overview of the entire project. Uh, uh, we'll now uh, start talking about what, what's going on in the project. So overall, in the past week, there were 67 pull requests merged by 10 authors. There's some new authors I see, M. Montal, Mr. Pank Zero, um, T.C. Franks, uh, Mikhail Kokuska, and uh, those are maybe not brand new, but they're uh, relatively new. Uh, so those 67 pull requests were reviewed by seven reviewers. And um, there were 18 closed issues by eight people and 13 open by 13 people. So let's go on to um, the core. Um, Scott, would you be interested in reading the core? Sure. Uh, okay, so the stats for the core, we had five pull requests merged from four different authors. Uh, new Pixel Clay is a new author, so thank you to them. Uh, we had three re reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. We have 30 open pull requests, um, which is kind of a lot. <laughs> so it would be great to get this down. I, I kind of like, it really bothers me when it's more than a page, um, which I think is 25. So we should um, take a look at these and... I know people like leaving drafts open, but maybe we should have a discussion in the weeds about how to actually do that, because I, I know it bothers me. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll add that later. Uh, for issues, we had seven closed issues by five people and seven opened by seven people for a total of 577 open issues. Um, this number does tend to slowly increase, um, but we categorize issues um, so that we have an idea of like urgency, particularly uh, in terms of prior prioritization for folks who are Adafruit funded. Um, so we have 28 open issues on 8.0, which is the stuff that Adafruit funded folks are working on kind of first and foremost uh, in order to get ADO stable out. Uh, we have 500, 503 open long-term issues. These are the ones that are the kind of the lowest priority for Adafruit funded folks. Uh, and then we have five issues not assigned to milestone. These are the things that we haven't triaged yet and that we should triage and, and will triage today. So um, that is the state of the circuit and core. All right, thank you, Scott. All right, let's move on to the state of the libraries. Um, Katni, can you do that? All right, thank you. Um, so this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore as well as a few extras, uh, including our cookie cutter and the community bundle. So over the last week, we had 59 pull requests merged from four different authors and four different reviewers. Um, this seems like a lot. I will explain why um, when I'm done, uh, when we get past this part. Um, the longest standing one was 23 days, so it's good to see we're still getting through some older PRs. Uh, majority of them were three to two days old, um, leaving us with 87 open pull requests. And as I stated last week, when the number was almost twice that, um, we made um, some basic 
changes not functional changes to like across all the libraries um and all of those are getting merged finally so um that is why there are so many prs and um you'll notice later that there are not very many updated libraries that's because eva was waiting to do the merge sweep before doing the release sweep we had 11 closed issues by four people and five open by five people, leaving us with 588 open issues. 98 of those are labeled good first issue. If you are interested in um, in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests listed out and all of the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great label to start with on the issues. Um, we have a guide on contributing to uh, CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help you out. We don't, don't let the process intimidate you. We want to make sure that you can contribute in a way that works for you. If you're interested in reviewing, check out all the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, please test it. If you do not, uh, take a look at the code, let us know how it looks, syntax, spelling, stuff like that. Um, any kind of assistance like that is super helpful, and um, we we love to hear it. So leave a comment, let us know you did that, and once you're comfortable with that, um, we can talk about leveling you up to our review team. Uh, this week in Library Pi PI download stats, the total library downloads over 323 libraries was 183,107. And the top 10, um, the first four are still pretty standard. Uh, NeoPixel is, is up higher than it has been in a bit. Um, and uh, the rest of the list is actually looking uh, kind of changed up this week too. So if you're interested in that, it's in the notes doc. Um, as I stated, there are a few updated libraries, but no new libraries uh, this week. So um, keep an eye out for that. Uh, and also the list should be pretty long uh, next week as uh, the sweep should be should be done this week sometime to release everything. That's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Katni. Okay, uh, next up is um, State of Blinka and uh, Maker Melissa usually reads that if you're able. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython and Raspberry Pi boards. And uh, so for the Blinka section, this includes Blinka and uh, the uh, Platform Detect and the Pure I.O. and a couple other uh, Blinka specific libraries like the Display I.O. and the Extended uh, but the but, uh, extended Bus Library. And uh, this week we had Three pull requests merged by two authors and one reviewer. Uh, that leaves six open pull requests amongst all those different places. And there were zero closed issues and one open, uh, leaving a net of 86 open issues. Uh, we had 21,816 PyPI downloads in last week. And we are up to... Um, 8,010 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we're at 98 boards currently. Actually, we're, we're really at 99, but we need to add it to the uh, circuitpython.org, and then it should appear as 99 here. And that's it. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. Uh, we'll now move on to Hug Reports. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start uh, with the Hug Reports and we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting but have re Hug Reports in the notes document, I'll read them off as I get to you in the list. All right, so I'll start. Um, I'd like to thank MicroDev for keeping an expert eye on the Espresso-related uh, PRs. They often are able to spot things that um, being very familiar with is expressive development. They're often able to spot things that uh, I might miss if I make a, a PR. And thanks to Naradoc, who uh, is paid to do all kinds of continuing support uh, in the, in Discord and in the forums. And thank you very much, Naradoc. 
he he does it with expertise and patience. We really appreciate it. Uh, now we'll move on to Anic data. Uh, thanks to Bill eighty eight T and Paul one for the. Um, let me just take a timestamp before I forget. Uh, for the Pico W Wi Fi uh, AP, and thanks to Mikhail Pakusa for major improvements in the Adafruit HTTP server library. And I'd also like to thank Mikhail for that, those changes. He really did a great job of cleaning up the library. Thank you very much. Uh, next is DJ Devin. You can go ahead if you're available. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to give a hug to Naradoc and Hem for helping me out with the rainbow PWM code uh, so that I could get the RGB um, mod working on the step switches. And a group hug to everyone who makes Adafruit, CircuitPython, and cool stuff happen every week. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's now move on to Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, this week, hug reports. Uh, first one for uh, Mark Gambler for help testing and fixing some errors, as well as implementing the slice getter inside the pixel map uh, that I've been working on this week, as well as uh, also thank you to Mark for pointing me towards some resources to uh, use um, basically for debugging on the ESP32 S2 um, more in depth than normal. So thanks to Mark for that stuff. Uh, thank you to Jeff, who started the pixel map stuff initially, uh, the stuff that I've been working on this week um, uh, in, with help from Mark. Um, as well as uh, Jeff pointed out a feature on GitHub to me this week that I hadn't seen before, like an accept change from, uh, I guess, a proposed change as part of a PR. So that was a very convenient way to um, approve uh, somebody's proposed change. Thanks for that. Um, thank you to DJ Devin 3 who found and shared a link back with me from an old video where I was working on debugging hard faults. And I was attempting the same thing again, but I had forgotten the process. Uh, so that old video actually helped quite a bit to get caught up to where I needed to be. Uh, and then uh, thank you to Scott uh, Tanu for reviews and discussion on the Display.io API change, as well as a point in the right direction for where to find the initialization uh, that happens inside there where we needed to make some tweaks. Uh, and then a group hug for everybody. Thanks. OK, thank you. OK, uh, next up is Jeff. Hello. So I wanted to thank uh, Tim and Mark for picking up work on the Encore Pixel Map class. I tend to pick up a lot of shiny things and then not necessarily finish them. So I'm counting on you two now to get this over the finish line. Uh, to Katni for chatting last week, both personal and technical. To Anne, kudos for reaching a milestone of newsletter subscribers. To Ingrid, my spouse, for helping me tidy my work area this weekend. It was a little bit out of control. And uh, last but not least, a group hug. All right, thank you, Jeff. Okay, next up is Katni. Thanks, Dan. So uh, first up, a hug for Jeff for helping me with some last minute changes to a personal project I was working on and was able to finish it by my goal of before Thursday. To Dan for some suggestions on how I could make an outdoor project completely quick disconnect. I left one of the wires, one of the sets of wires hardwired and didn't think about it until it wasn't working and I wished I could easily bring the whole thing in the house. Um, also to Jeff for a wonderful chat and catch up last week. To Liz for writing up the code for my upcoming project guides. Um, I'm sure I missed people and a group hug. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up is Maker Melissa. I just wanted to give a group hug to everyone. All right, thank you. OK, uh, next up, I've got um, a couple of people who are text only. First, Mark Gambler. Uh, thanks to Paul Cutler for having me on the CircuitPython show this week. And thanks to Jeff and Foamy Guy for working on the Pixel Map class. And then MicroDev gives a group hug. And thanks to uh, Scott for fixing a bug in the continuous integration script. OK, and next is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug report to Melissa for hosting Show and Tell and also all of her work on code.circuitpython.org. Hug report to Geek Mob Projects for trying out the web workflow and posting about it on Mastodon. Uh, hug report to Lord Ryback and R Dagger for digging into building CircuitPython. I think both of them came along in the forums, and I suggested that they do that. So it's, it's cool to see people taking me up on that. Uh, thank you to Badlock B for uh, the PR that they're working on adding code spaces support. 
Uh, I think what this will allow you to do is like use the the online GitHub code editor to to edit and build uh, at least Cortex M boards, which will be awesome. Um, Hug report to Foamy Guy for making uh, the root group settable, which is a an API change we talked about uh, starting with CircuitPython eight. And then uh, lastly, a hug report to Dishipu, Naradak, Kiyoshi, and Foamy Guy for helping folks on the Discord channel, particularly with the help with channel. Uh, so thanks to everyone there. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, and uh, uh, finally, Tectric, who's text only, gives a group hug. Okay, now we'll move on to status updates, uh, which is our time to sync up on what we're doing. Um, I will start and we'll go through the list alphabetically as before. Um, when I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. And what you're doing does not have to be exactly CircuitPython related if you've renovated your kitchen and you're proud of it and that's what occupied your time, that's fine too. Whatever, whatever uh, is, you think would be interesting. Okay, I'll start. Um, take another timestamp. Uh, this was a light week due to Thanksgiving. I was uh, out of town for several days. Um, I first of all, I uh, fixed um, a couple of APIs in Wi-Fi Radio, whose signatures were not quite right in the documentation, and also the code that checked the validity of the arguments that were passed in was also not quite right. So I fixed those things. Um, in on Sam Sam B fifty one and related chips, I fixed uh, playing mono files when stereo output is requested. Um, before this fix, uh, there would be a buzzing noise part sometimes, like about half the time when you were playing uh, mono files, but you were outputting to two uh, DAC outputs, so that's fixed. And um, in both of these cases, I was fixing, trying to fix something else, which I could not reproduce, but in the process of trying to test things, I discovered these other problems. So it seems to be my life in the past, for the past couple of weeks. I'll continue working on 8.0 issues this week, and I think we'll make another beta uh, this week. So I'll do that. Not exactly sure when, uh, but when the Pico, when Scott uh, finishes and the Pico W uh, web workflow and it's reviewed. That's a, probably a good time to do that. All right, uh, next up is DJ Devon. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see, I don't know if this was really last week or, yeah, it was this week. I successfully modified the Adafruit step switch into an RGB step switch. It's a hacky modification, not a drop-in. A soldering iron and a Dremel or sandpaper are required to make the, the modification. Uh, because you have to fit a four-pin LED into the two-pin housing. Uh, this now offers a way for anyone doing a project with step switches to make them RGB if they really want to. Uh, and I have a 10-minute video on my YouTube channel that shows the entire modification process from start to finish. Uh, I have yet to make another revision. I have to make another revision of my TR Cowbell um, board in order to accept the new four-pin uh, RGB LEDs. Uh, which also requires PCA multiplexers because four times 16 step switches is a lot of pins. Um, the step switch breakout boards from Adafruit only accommodate holes for two pin LEDs. Uh, so they initially for forwent the, the four pins. Um, so they might have to update their next board revision to accept the RGB LEDs and put those four pin holes in there, uh, which is going to make their board revision a little bit different looking. Uh, I finished up the cyber ski goggles from a proof of concept to reality. I uh, used a QD Pi S2 and a 350 milliamp battery for that. I went on show and tell last week and showed off both the ski goggles and the step switch mod. Uh, and I put a link uh, to the CircuitPython GitHub code uh, powering uh, both of those. So those two are easily searchable on my GitHub. I started working on a request API for Instagram only to figure out that you need a Facebook developer account because I never realized that like Instagram was face. I don't use them, so I didn't know that they were both owned by Facebook. 
so if anyone, and then I decided against it because uh, I don't really use Facebook and not a fan of it. Uh, so if anyone wants to do a Facebook or Instagram API, there are now plenty of request API examples in the request library example folder in order to create one. I've decided not to be the one to do that. Instead, I've decided my next API to tackle will probably be Octopart. Uh, and I switched Mastodon servers this week uh, onto the Hackaday Social, the, which is a new Mastodon instance that just popped up. And because it's kind of maker-related, I figured nah, it's kind of more appropriate for me to go there. And I really wish I had a fruit would make one. So I would join that immediately. Uh, so you can find me at treasuredev at hackaday.social. That's it. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so last week I worked uh, on a couple of different things, primarily in the core. One of them was making the root group settable on display objects. This was the uh, display OAPI change that we discussed a few weeks back uh, in the weeds. Um, in particular, I was working mostly last week on what happens when you set it to none. It used to be you would set it to none to show the CircuitPython terminal. Uh, in the new version, though, none will actually just show nothing. Uh, but when I first attempted to make that change, I ran into a hard fault, uh, tried a couple of different ways to debug it, um, which took some time getting back into the swing of things with debugging uh, core stuff, because I hadn't done that for a little while, and I haven't done it enough to just be familiar with it. Uh, but we eventually got there, uh, found out the ESP32 S2 actually makes that super duper easy, uh, just has a pin available there to read it. Um, so that was pretty straightforward. I did eventually end up getting it resolved by using that debug pin on the on the Feather TFT and then parsing the results that came out of there, figured out what part of the code needed to be fixed, and got that done. Um, not before uh, taking the t detour, though, as I was trying to debug that hard fault, one of the things I tried to do was um, use a Metro M4 device because it has the little debug header that can connect to a J-Link, so I thought that was uh, going to be making stuff easier to debug, and when I did that, I ran into a different hard fault. So I've got uh, something else, um, I think something unrelated, to look into this week that I'll try to narrow down a bit further. I did make an issue for it with my initial findings, but I'm uh, going to try to pare it down to less uh, less code to try to figure out where it's at more specifically. Um, the other one uh, inside the core that I worked on last week was the pixel map PR. Uh, I spent a bit of time figuring out how to get it reverted back to a good version after I uh, messed up the merge. I tried to merge main to get it updated, and I must have done that incorrectly because I ended up with a broken one for a bit. But I got that straightened out and then worked on the uh, Python layer, the Python code that will essentially use that new core class. Um, I did the wrote the actual code for it, or really just adjusted what's there today. Since it's an existing Python class, it just needs adjusted to use the core one. So I did that, and then tested out the existing examples with it. Um, for this week, I uh, so far today uh, I was working on some of that stuff, uh, the display I/O API change. I got that worked out the rest of the way this morning, um, and put in the uh, latest commits that I think resolve everything. I also uh, uploaded a tester script that um, runs through all the different scenarios and prints out the results after each step, so it's easier to figure out what it's doing and when it's doing it. Um, hoping to get the pixel map effort finished up this week. Uh, I'll be pulling in the slicing getter code uh, with help from Mark, and then um, if we decide we want to do it, uh, move the Python code to its new home. And I have an entry in the weeds to discuss that a bit later. Uh, and then the other thing that I uh, did so far today was uh, work on the uh, HTTP server. Um, that was changed recently. I think it was mentioned a bit ago, actually. Um, it was changed recently, and one of the changes was making it into a, uh, a package, I guess, a folder instead of a single file. And so the uh, import syntax needed updated. Um, somebody found a learn guide today in the help with channel that was not importing correctly. So I looked into that and figured out that was the reason and uh, submitted a PR to change the imports for that. And that's what I got going on. Thanks. All right. Thank you. OK, uh, next up is Jeff. Hello. Uh, so like many of you, last week was a short week due to the holiday, um, although I started and completed the code for the next keyboard uh, to USB HID adapter with CircuitPython. And then uh, just kind of lazily over the weekend, I printed the parts and built it. The uh, Noe and Pedro are doing a collab with me um, holiday theme. So uh, I'll put some LED strips on it, and then we can start working on some code. And I'm not sure exactly when 
that will come out because it's also dependent on a new product going into the store. Um, so this week, my number one is CircuitPython core bugs that uh, were assigned to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last week? Assigned to me last week when we went through the bug list um, in a separate meeting. I will maybe work on completing the guide text for the next keyboard, although my goal is for that to be published in December, so I've got time. Uh, as I mentioned, I may start writing uh, code for this holiday-themed LED object. And uh, finally, if you are waiting on me for something, please ping again. My inboxes got out of hand. I archived a bunch of stuff. Um, so I may have snubbed you. And just just uh, please ping me again. And that's what I got. OK, thank you, Jeff. OK, uh, next up is Cadney. Hello. So last week was super short. Uh, I met with Liz to discuss the code she sent me for my upcoming project guides to get a better understanding of it. And um, uh, suggest changes. Uh, Liz made all the changes and sent the updated code back to me. I worked through some of it to um, change up a couple things. It was mostly formatting and comments. Um, I have to finish that up this week. And so this week I'm uh, getting caught up from last week. Um, at some point, hoping to meet with Tectric about an Adabot PR, but it's really not um, critical. Uh, we keep putting it off, so that's fine. Um, file an issue on the Adafruit I.O. library about IP-based time not working properly. Um, short version is that uh, the Adafruit I.O. library doesn't give you the opportunity to pass in a, a specific time zone, so it tries to guess based on your IP, uh, and that is not happening. Um, so it, re it, it just uses uh, UTC. I need to finish cleaning up the project code and get it back to Liz so it can get up on Learn. And then this week, I plan to begin the countdown holiday countdown display project and work through it, uh, work work through the end of the week um, on it. So we'll see where I've gotten by then. Um, and uh, in personal news, which I have way more of, um, I wrote up a feather version of the previous Pi based receiver for my Laura mailbox notifier. I didn't write the original Pi code, so I had no idea how to modify it and add an ad, add in Adafruit I/O code as well. The Pi was overkill from the beginning, and with and the feathers with built-in TFTs hadn't been released yet. So the Pi with Laura bonnet, including the display, made the most sense. Uh, this version uses the status NeoPixel for the status LED instead of a bare LED. Displays info on the built-in TFT, sends the mailbox and battery data to Adafruit I/O, which sends you an email when the mailbox door is open and when your battery is low. Um, the NeoPixel is nestled between two taller components, so uh, in an effort to make it uh, more obvious, I ended up hot gluing a chunk of hot glue tube um, over the um, NeoPixel. Worked like a charm. Um, it's essentially adding a small light pipe, um, but it's short and is about the same size as a chunky bare LED that I had soldered to the Pi. I uh, made a number of attempts to make the boot button easier to press. It's rather tiny and rather close to the reset button. None of the methods I tried worked, but it's worth noting that all of them involved hot glue. Hot glue is difficult to apply precisely, so it just blobbed everywhere and the button wouldn't work. Um, I did manage to make a tiny dot of it once, but the method didn't stay on the board for more than a minute, so that was pointless. And it's more compact than the Pi, obviously, and in um, the event of issues will be much easier to troubleshoot. Uh, this is interesting because this is why we made CircuitPython what it is. I realized two days later that I had not copied the code off the feather after making further edits, and that meant I didn't have a current copy of it. My dad is not exactly tech savvy, but I walked him through plugging the feather into his computer, finding CircuitPy, copying code.py to his desktop, and emailing me. It took four minutes over the phone, and it worked perfectly. Um, I still want to clean up the sender code and update the receiver to match. Um, so that's part of why I needed the receiver code. The other half is that I can update my GitHub repo with the Feather version. I lucked into Pi Zero Ws from a coworker for the original project. For most folks, they're basically on Obtainium for now, so it'll be nice to have a more readily available version. Um, finally, I ordered some super glue to try to glue something on top of the button and make it simpler to press. We'll see if my idea works or not. That's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Okay, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, last week, I uh, worked on code.circuitpython.org and fixed some bugs related to the web workflow. And I'm currently redoing the USB workflow uh, using some functions that work better with the other workflows. Uh, this week, I'm going to add some new 
or I need to add some new Blinka boards to the to CircuitPython.org and help make it to 100 boards, and then continue working on code.circuitpython.org, and then maybe we'll come and play them what be able to go next. That's where I'm at. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up is um, Paul Cutler. Thanks, Dan. Uh, there's a new episode of the Circuit Python show out today with Mark Gambler. We chat about how he got started with computers, going viral with his Monster Eyes project, and contributing to the Circuit Python core. Thanks. Okay, and now Scott. Hello. I've been getting back into the swing of doing reviews and issues. I'm sure you all noticed me commenting on stuff. Um, I have a PR out for adding the web workflow to the Pico W without MDNS, so you have to use the IP. But I do have MDNS working uh, with some LWIP modifications, and we'll PR that next. Um, and hopefully it'll get in this week. I'll look at other Webflow issues after that. Uh, and I also just realized that there was two um, API changes I was suggesting that I should probably do this week as well. Uh, so I'll add that to my list. Uh, I fly to Michigan on the 14th of December, so we have like two and a half weeks until I'm like away from my desktop and all of my stuff. So uh, I'm kind of starting to think ahead about like which dev boards and what do I want to bring my CLEA or my JLink and, and stuff like that. So thinking about that. Um, and then this weekend, uh, kind of in personal stuff, I spent the weekend thinking about how to catalog what files are on what external drives. <laughs> in terms of uh, keeping track of backups and where back where files live in backups and uh, like if they're on Google Photos as well, that sort of stuff. So if you have tips uh, and pointers, please bug me in the Discord about that too. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Scott. And finally, I'll read um, Tectrix contribution, text only. Uh, last week, uh, wedding, turkey day, and sickness. Oh my, so nothing to report on last week. This week, continue working on the PyPy stats update with Catney. Start working on the PyLint upgrade for the Learn Guide examples. Continue working on the command line tool for uploading CircuitPython firmware to boards. So this is not CircUp, it's kind of like UF2 up or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, looking at things on a backlog to do and to prioritize, so review and to prioritize, so reviewing that this week. In personal projects, it's time to make the CircuitPython Nukia en masse for friends and family. That's a Hanukkah menorah based on CircuitPython. And I received the PCBs and have begun ordering components. All right, thank you, everybody. Our next section is in the weeds, where we do uh, long-form discussions um, of various kinds. And we can just start up. Right away, I'll take a timestamp here. And Jeff has something to say about the uh, holiday schedule. Yeah, so I know a lot of folks take time away from their computers during December, and I greatly support this. Uh, so just a heads up that in the upcoming meeting calendar, we do not have a meeting uh, December 26th or at all that week. Uh, but I did want to find out what people would like to do about the meeting that would normally be January 2nd. Um, we could hold it on January 2nd, on January 3rd, or skip it. I and, would like uh, to it on the 3rd. On the 3rd? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else with an opinion? All right. Then I'm, I'm, hosting, I'm hosting that one, and the 3rd works fine. All right. That's good to know. All right. Then I will generate the 2020-2023 meeting calendar uh, based on that. And that will include no meeting the week of December the 25th, 2023, which is just around the corner uh, 13 months from now. Thank you. OK, next is Foamy Guy, who has an API question. All right, thank you. Um, my question is basically around the new uh, pixel map. So for folks that don't know, Jeff uh, started working on this to, well, let's uh, let's take one extra step back further, actually, for folks that don't know. In the LED animation, there's a class called pixel map. It helps you basically take a grid of LEDs and treat groups of pixels within that grid as a single LED for the purposes of animation. So you could turn them all on to the same color at the same time. 
Um, that class today is inside the LED animation. Jeff worked on a new one that lives inside the core that's more efficient uh, because it is inside the core instead of Python code. Um, the root of my question is sh there will be still a Python class called pixel map. Should it stay where it is today, which is inside the LED animation uh, library? Uh, it's inside, I think, a helpers.py file, if I recall correctly. Uh, or should it move to a new library like Adafruit Circuit Python pixel map, and then it would get imported as Adafruit pixel map, and it would be all on its own separate from LED animation, but of course LED animation would still use it, um, or the examples there within, I guess. Um, any thoughts on that from anyone? I, I have this idea that it, it might be, can you, it seems to me it might be useful in other contexts than the animation library. Like, yes, like yeah, definitely. Like wants to display text scrolling or something, I don't know, something else. That's not yeah. necessarily an, anim an animation. Yeah, definitely agreed. I was thinking about that as I was writing some of the testing scripts um, that weren't using that that weren't actually using animations at the time. And yeah, I was kind of musing on it a bit, thinking that it was y there's lots of uses for this idea of basically just treating arbitrary groups of pixels as one, um, especially because you can make multiples of these maps on the same strand. So you can kind of like one second be treating certain groups together, and then the next second uh, change and be treating an entirely different set of groups um, together. And that's totally independent from the animation library. So you can do all of that um, by itself. So maybe that points towards it being on its own then probably, I would think, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, because it's like, oh, this is actually a, a general purpose thing that was made for a specific use case, but there are other use cases. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's I will... Uh, work on cookie cutting up a new library for that then. Right now I have a draft PR submitted in LED animation just so I had a place to put the code, but I'll cookie cut that into its own library and um, get that going this week. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And finally, uh, Scott has some questions. Mm -hmm. Discussion topic. So I was looking at the PRs that we have open and a number of them are draft and i'm very sensitive to the number of prs that are open at the top like the 29 um and i'm wondering what policy we should have for draft um like when do we leave them open when do we move them to issues um, because i'd rather them not just hang around I, I feel that it's kind of a deficiency of the GitHub UI that they're mixed up with the regular PRs. Right. Like they are open, but they're just long term, you know, or they're on hold or something. And there's no way to indicate that. Um, right. In that list, it doesn't, you can't sort it, you can't push them all to the end or anything. So. Right. We can make a mechanism that says, oh, yeah, we'll close them. But like you're saying, like, keep an issue open for them. But they aren't really closed. You know, they're not really closed. So I feel kind of funny closing them because then they fall off people's radar. Well, that's that's why I was thinking, like, having issues that link to those branches. Yeah. So 10 of the 29 open ones are draft. I mean, I think we can, I think it's, it's a good idea to have um, issues for them because it's always nice to have a corresponding issue. Uh, right. I don't know. That's, we might ask, uh, for instance, Deshipu, we might ask him about I, some of the, what? some of the other ones are, are hanging out in various ways, but... Scott? Yeah? What is bothering you the most? Is it this list? It's or just them existing, period? It's the number. It's the 29 on this list. Top. Like, I'm, I'm asking tabs. because I'm almost certain that um, we might be able to do something with the API to eliminate the draft PRs from this list in Adabot that doesn't involve closing them? 
Well, yeah, I don't think so. I think, I think there's, I think it's a, it's a tag and we can, we can tell Adabot to ignore that tag. Are you talking about, but Scott, Scott, you're talking, there are two places where we see the list. One is in the weekly, in the status yeah, report that's, that's at the top of these notes. And yeah, that's not my concern. Okay, okay. that's what I my was My concern is like, on the page for circuit python right because like okay. i look i look at a lot of projects and the health of the project is indicated usually by how many pull requests there are in the backlog right and i pride us in keeping up with that except that number just gets higher and higher as if we collect prs so suppose that we just change the title so it had draft in all caps as the first let word or something. Would that make it easier to sort mentally? Well, it doesn't change the number that bothers me. We can't change the way that, like, without closing, we can't change the way that, that GitHub counts for that number at the top. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what you really want is long-term PRs. We don't have... Right. We don't have that. So, right. uh, I, I think that each of these is a sort of a, well, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a solution. It, it doesn't bother me as much. Mostly it bothers me because I have to keep reading them over and over again. The number right. doesn't bother me as much as the fact that they're intermingled. So. Right. And they're kind of like, I'd rather see them on a separate page or something like that. Right. And you, in the search, you can say draft colon true or false. Yeah. Scott, I'm curious, um, and maybe thinking about this and, and articulating kind of what you're feeling will help me understand better. The number of issues is much higher. <laughs> Why don't you want to go close all the issues that we marked long term in so that that number's smaller? Um, I I mean, ideally that would be the case too, right? But I think the reason that I'm the reason I'm more sensitive for the PR number is because that usually indicates work that people have done, right? Where issues are just like people with random thoughts or bugs or ideas. But PRs usually indicate like how promptly things get done. Um, and so like if I run across a project where there's 30 PRs open, like I'm less likely to propose another PR because I don't think that it's going to get in. So you're, you're thinking that people who stumble on CircuitPython are put off by the number of open PRs. Yes. Okay. I think the more PRs you have open, the less likely people are to make another one. So, hmm. <laughs> Sounds like it's, I'm the only one that this bothers, which is part of the reason I wanted to bring it yeah. up. Well, I mean, I feel a little bit like it's a case of we, when you you start measuring something for a good reason, like the number of open pull requests, but then it it turns from you know just just one one signal that's used for good to now we're going to manipulate this number to be lower because we think the number should be lower, and that feels. That feels like, you know, the system made us do something and it, is that really serving our best interest? And you make a case for how it serves our interest in how other people are responding to that number. And that's all, that's all true, but I'm a little bit sad that just because of this number that GitHub chose to put in a spot, mm -hmm. um, we're going to, for instance, make it tougher for people to um, get information about whether the thing that they're working on builds on all the boards. Um, that doesn't re that doesn't require a PR though, right? Like at various times, I've had trouble with actions in my fork, and for may maybe that's not the case right now. But right now, I mean, actions I is off in my fork, and I create draft pull requests in part to get those built. If I need to change what I'm doing, 
that's fine. And of course, um, like you know, we might also say Adafruit people are going to do one thing. This is what we want Adafruit people to do, and they'll do it. But it doesn't really bother me if it's like in draft for two days. Like it bothers me if it's in, been in draft since July, right? Like, I guess I guess part of my point is that like it's actually just all PRs that are really old. <laughs> but I I I think like draft drafts are new and drafts are <sighs> a way to indicate that it's not ready yet and. Like, should it ju should it just hang there if nobody's working on it? Well, I, I when, think if there's... Like, the code can still exist in other places and be linked to in other ways. Um, I mean, I think the ones that are hanging out based on some, some blocking thing, uh, we could turn those into issues. And... and and maybe even we could even put a title at the top that says like reopen, reopenable or something like that, you know, and then the issue would be there. Um, so I think we could look. I think that there are some that are that fall into this category and some that don't, and we should probably just look at them in more detail yeah. rather than making a policy. Like I mean, Deshi Poo has one that's open for a board that he hasn't had time to work on. So yeah, I could. It would make sense. We could close that, realizing that it would be closed temporarily. It's kind of like gone on vacation, right? This PR is right. gone on vacation, and or you know, this restaurant has gone on vacation. And when it comes, when the people come back, then it, it'll, it'll the restaurant will reopen again. That's that, right. That's like, okay. and we can reopen PRs as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, we can even comment on PRs that are closed. Right. Right. So I'd right. say let's let's look at the ones that we have and try to do something with each of them and make up a a a, 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 a um, make up an issue like you say and that that is the way to track them and uh, which I I, I I had thought of something to add that's related to this um, which we can move on to if <laughs> which is. Um, I, I yeah. there are a lot of long term issues. Some of them are very aspirational, mm -hmm. and we're probably never going to do them. Some of them are bugs, and bug long term bugs tend to disappear, and that's kind of bad. And it's mm -hmm. true that they're tagged as bugs, but people don't look at the list that way. So I was wondering if we should have two milestones at least for long term bugs and long term enhancements. That's fine with me. That would be that would be interesting. Does anybody think that's a bad idea? Because I then I, mean, I would it, we really be able to see like okay, there's a bunch of aspirational things here, and yet and then there are other things that are kind of low priority, but somebody could work on this, and it's a kind of a defined task, and that's what I'd like to see. Or somebody who wants to know whether like you know how why is what are the audio problems or something like that. That's... Well, I, th I well, I think I think what are the audio problems is better served by le looking for the label audio bug, right? Rather than audio long term. Right. I wouldn't make audio long term, but I just like to split long term into um, into uh, feature, you know, enhancement versus bugs. Just so that we can have a count. Yeah. Like... Just so we can have a count, and so we can, and so things, and so long term bugs don't get. Um, lost. So I out of our long term, them. out of our long term issues, uh, the, they are labeled. One hundred and seventy of them are labeled bug, and the remaining three hundred and eighty one are not labeled bug. So just as a statistic, that's one third are bugs. Okay, but I think the some of the older ones are from before we started consistently labeling ones as bug or, and there's also like bug and enhancement. So. They could certainly be labeled one or the other. There are probably some that are not labeled. Anyway, that's just that's just something that I might clean up. If, if you don't object yeah. to that, then I'll do that. I, I actually would push back on the idea that it needs to be a milestone. Because it sounds to me like you're really wanting better labeling. <laughs> like That's really what labels are. And the nice thing about labels is that you can have multiple on there. Like I really like labeling them by port as well. Right? Yeah. Like, well, maybe we should have... 
it's like we should have be able to add some project defined buttons at the top of the issues thing, which we can't do right now. These are here's a, that's another GitHub feature. Okay, for, yeah. for like common, common like breakdowns. Yes, yes. Like oh, the, you know, show me all the long term bugs. You know, right now you have to type in a, either you keep a bookmark or you have to make up a, a search. Right. I find I find the port specific labels probably even more helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and for the for the like well defined things like that really should be like good first issue. Um, should be for the like, this would be great if somebody would be able to pick this could yeah. pick this up. Like there, yeah. I guess I would push back on the idea that a milestone makes it any easier. Okay, it, it's really because um, right a milestone is a, is being used as a as a, a super tag kind of in this case and. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to think of milestone as a different dimension. Yeah. It's a time dimension. Right. Or a prioritization. Right. right. Although exactly. lots of people, I think, lots of projects do use labels for priority as well. Right. Um, right. We don't have 800 bugs and 800 enhancements. We don't have make that split right now. Yeah. Right. Um, but milestones have the benefit that you can see, like, how many there are open and how complete they are. All right. So the action item is to review the draft ones and figure out if, if they can be closed without hurting something, as long as we make a corresponding issue. So let's, let's, let's check on that. Yes. And we may, we may not do that to all of them, but we may need to do it to a bunch. Yeah, I mean, generally, it, it, we just, it would be good to go through all these yeah. PRs. And I, I think it would also be good, to actually, to label the draft ones in the statistics in the Adabot, actually. Yeah. And I, I opened an issue for that, but I haven't done it. Yeah, and maybe we, like, maybe we should start labeling these better, too. Like, yeah. I added the board label explicitly, because that's really common. Yeah. Um, but maybe... We should be better about labeling PRs so we can do better finer grain breakdowns there as well. All right. All right. I think I think I think this is good. Ooh, GitHub projects has more advanced milestones. Hmm. <laughs> All right, we'll check on that. Thank you, Microdev. Yeah, thanks. Oh, it's like a Kanban board. Okay. Well, projects. We don't use projects and we could. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I will. Uh, I'll wrap up because it's been almost an hour. Um, let me put a timestamp here. Um, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for November twenty eighth, twenty twenty two. Thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you very very much. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, the meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, U.S. time, 11 a.m. Pacific. That's December 5th. Um, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. And if you want to be notified about this meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at sign circuit Pythonista's role on Discord. And you'll get uh, pings about that. We hope to see you all next week or hear from you. Thank you, everybody. And I Thanks, will everyone. Stop recording now.